Hi, welcome to the Sifu Mimi Chan Show. Thanks for joining the conversation. As we honor AAPI Heritage Month, there is one interview that I think everyone should hear. I had the privilege of speaking with Richard Sakurai about his experience in a Japanese internment camp. We recorded this interview in 2017. At that time, he was 91 years old. Please enjoy the best of AAPI Heritage Month conversations with Dick Sakurai. The internment of Japanese Americans in the United States during World War II was the forced relocation and incarceration in camps in the western interior of the country of people of Japanese ancestry, in which about 62% of the internees were United States citizens. This internment is considered to have resulted more from racism than from any security risk posed by Japanese Americans. What was it like in a Japanese internment camp? How could this happen and how can we keep this from ever happening again? I had the privilege of speaking with Richard Sakurai about life in a Japanese internment camp. Richard, who prefers to go by Dick, recalls his experience of being taken away from his home, attending high school in the camp, and being drafted when he turned 18. He is now a young 91 years old, and I am grateful that he was so gracious to spend time talking to me about his life pre and post World War II as a Japanese American. Dick even had to graduate from high school in the camp, where he lived for almost three years. I was amazed at his calm and good natured attitude towards this experience in his life, and am inspired by his kindness, wisdom, and fortitude. I also found it interesting at how his internment experience has shaped his modern day political stance. Listen to the end of our conversation to hear him discuss his philosophy on the culture of America today. He worries that the oppression and racism he experienced during World War II is happening to other cultures today like Black Americans and Muslim Americans. I believe in learning and listening to the wisdom of someone like Dick who has endured so much and experienced so much of history. If you are enjoying these conversations, please rate my podcast on your platform of choice and share it with others. If you would like to support the work I do with a donation, you can become a patron of the show by visiting my website or patreon.com slash Sifu Mimi Chan. For comments or suggestions, reach out on social media at Sifu Mimi Chan. Now on with the show. All right. Hi, Dick. How are you? Thank you so much for joining me on my podcast today. Uh, thank you for, for inviting me. Yes. Well, I'm, I'm really honored to have you as a guest after I read and heard a little bit about your story. But I'd like to kind of get started to getting to know you a little bit better. And why don't you tell me a little bit about where you grew up and a little bit about your family? Well, I grew up in, in Trotdale, Oregon, which is a, a, a farming community just outside of Portland, Oregon. My father was an, an immigrant that, that came to this country in, I think, 1912 to join his father and stepmother who had come to this country at around about, about the turn of the century, about 1900, and had left uh, my father behind uh, in Japan to be raised by his grandparents and, until he graduated from his schooling. And then after he graduated, graduated from his schooling, he came to this country. And uh, my mother was born in Portland, Oregon, to my grandfather and grandmother, who also had come to this country uh, about the the turn of the century, 1900. And so my mother was born in 1905 in Portland, Oregon. Well, when she was a, a, a young girl, my grandfather and grandmother returned to Japan so my mother went with her with them, and uh, so she got most of her schooling in Japan. And in the meantime, my grandfather had also come back to this country 
again. And so my, my mother, uh, after she graduated from school, came and joined him uh, in Portland, Oregon. I see. And what year were you born? I was born in 1926. I see. And so you grew up in Oregon and you went to school there in your formative years? Uh, I went to school in Corbett, Oregon, which is a, a, a small community just east of Trotdale. And uh, uh, I went there and through the 10th grade when, of course, uh, uh, the, the Second World War started and we, we had to be uh, you know, uh, interned. I see. So, so I didn't graduate from the school in Corbett, Oregon, but I continued my, my schooling in, in the camps. I see. And so previously, b- before the war started, uh, you pretty much kind of lived a very typical, you know, Asian American life, would you say? What was it like at that time in Oregon for an Asian American? Well, uh, it was during the Great Depression, and of course, uh, uh, we were also one of the uh, minorities that were looked down upon. So uh, we lived in a farming community, which had a, a small community of Japanese Americans, and uh, uh, very, very tough times uh, because mm-hmm. because of the depression. Uh, right, and, and you yourself did you also help with the farming? Oh, yes. Uh, as soon as I was able to, uh, I helped on the farm. Yeah. And what kind of hours, how, how difficult was that, or did you enjoy it? Well, no, not, not particularly. Uh, it was hard work. It was at, after, after school and during the summers and then on the weekends. Uh, it was always a matter of work, working on the farm. Right. So it seems like even before the war, it was a quite, you know, challenging time, of course, because of the depression. Um, and how about your school life? Did you enjoy school or was it also uh, difficult because you were discriminated against or because, like you said, people look, kind of look down on you? Well, uh, actually, uh, school was, was, was a good experience for me. I, I, I liked school and uh, I did well in school and and. Uh, and actually, the uh, my classmates, most of them were were quite accepting of me. Uh, I mean, there were uh, a few that that you know that showed overt uh, prejudice, uh, but but uh, most of them uh, I got along with most of them quite quite well, and uh, it, it was a. a, a fairly good experience. Oh, well, that's good. (laughs) And so um, moving forward, when did your family hear about the relocation centers and that they would be interring Japanese Americans? Was it something you had heard about that was happening before they actually came and and took you guys away? Or did it just happen very quickly? Well, of course, you know, there was a period between the time that uh, the war started and and when when we uh, were sent to the uh, camps, that uh, you know there, there were there were rumors and and uh, there were, of course there were also news stories uh, that that appeared that indicated that something like that was going to happen. Although uh, I I never. Be- Believe that it, that it actually was going to happen because uh, I you know I I I just thought that, that it couldn't they couldn't, couldn't possibly do something like that, but then of course uh, uh, gradually uh, it, it became clear that that was going to happen and and so so uh, and and um, how many people are in your family? There were eight altogether. There were yeah. eight. And so when they did actually tell you, okay, how, how did they announce it? Did they just show up at your door? Did you get a letter? How did they tell you guys, okay, you'll be moving? They put up, put up all these signs on, on telephone posts and, and the, uh, so forth saying that, that, that this was going to happen. Uh, uh, shortly before the, the the actual uh, removal of us, 
these these signs appeared on 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 telephone posts and things like that. To, I see. You know, and what was it like for you the day they came to move you? Well, uh, I, I uh, it just 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 this is just something that happened. I uh, I I really didn't feel the uh, the real implications of it until until later. I mean, it's just it's something that I would never uh, just it just didn't didn't seem like a. Uh, th- thing that that ought to happen. Of course not. Yeah. What were you allowed to take with you? Oh, we were allowed to t- take whatever we could carry. So uh, we we had you know uh, a suitcase each, and, and you know, and, and actually uh, we we had a suitcase and, and a, a duffel bag. We put uh, you know clothes and, and and things like that in, and then that, uh, that that's what we, what we were allowed to, to to take. Right? Did they tell you that they would be providing everything else for you? You would have a an, uh, a certain type of living situation. Did they kind of give you any indication of what it would be like? No, there was, there was not. There was no indication of what it was going to be like. Okay, and so your first. Um, where they moved you first was a, is it a relocation center? Or did you get moved a couple times or was it just one location? No, no, it was, uh, first we went to the, uh, what was called the assembly center, uh, in, in Portland, Oregon. It was in, in a, a big, uh, fairgrounds like building, uh, called the expo center, which, you know, they had, uh, uh Fair like uh, events, uh, you know, and uh, it was a, a, a big, 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 big building, which had a, a, a sort of an arena in the center, which which they used to 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 show various animals, and, and surrounding that arena was uh, a bunch of. Uh, uh, pens for the animals that that were that were being shown, and of course those, and of course uh, on the, on the periphery were uh, other kinds of rooms uh, like uh, uh, a, a kitchen and, and so forth. Uh, so so that you know events like a, like a, a fair could. Be, be conducted in that building. Uh, then, of course, uh, before we got there, uh, the uh, pe- animal pens were, were floored over, and and partitions put up, uh, and for to put to make make room for each family. Uh, that that that's that, that's the first place that we were sent to, which we spent uh, the first summer. Uh, Oh wow! So several, so a few months that you had to had to stay at the first uh, assembly center, and pretty much you had to stay where animals were staying. So you were pretty much treated like animals. Well, of course, it was it was floored over, but of course it was it was not uh, there was not nothing nothing was uh, was just just bare bare. Uh, Bunch of a bunch of cubicles, uh, uh, floored over the uh, where the animal pens were. Mm. That's terrible. And how big was the space per family? Was it all just the same size, regardless of the size of the family? Yeah, the, the, it, it, was, it was just just a row after row of these cubicles, which are barely enough to hold enough enough uh, army cots to uh, for us to sleep in I see and what was that what was the feeling like when you were there did it feel like you were literally a prisoner or were you really allowed to circulate and and go around or did did you feel very confined well uh, of course we, we, we could walk around any place and we wanted to in, inside that building, but of course outside that building, uh, there, there was a fence, uh, 
you know, up high fence uh, with uh, guard towers uh, and soldiers uh, uh, patrolling the outside. And so uh, you know, we felt free to wander around inside the building and just, just outside the building. But uh, uh, of course, we knew that, we, uh, that it w- we couldn't get out of there. Right. I mean, and as a teenager, you know, teenagers are pretty restless as it is. I mean, did you feel at, at any point like that injustice at that age? I know you were fairly young, but did you feel like, why are we here? We didn't do anything to deserve this. Did you feel like this was not just? Well, yeah, of course, of course, uh, we did. Uh, we didn't think that that was was the right thing to, for them to do. Uh, and when 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 uh, against uh, everything uh, how we thought about, uh, uh, you know, what the, what the government ought to be doing. Did you just feel though that you had no power to, you know? Um to be able to do anything different, though, did you feel, but maybe powerless, or that you just had no, pretty much, pretty much had no choice? Yeah, there, 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 nothing, nothing, nothing. Actually, we, we could do uh, at least, at least uh, from my perspective. I know I, I was just a young, uh, a young kid, and, and I, I didn't uh, know uh, much about what what went around. I, I didn't have. I didn't know what, what what to do. Right. Was the sentiment in, I mean, about how many people were in that whole assembly, would you say? How many families? Like a like hundred or a few hundred or? Well, I think there were, I think there were about 3,500 people in that building. Oh, wow. Okay. So, I mean, that's a lot of people to be basically cattling, right? I mean, that's a, that's a large amount of people to control. Was there at any point that there, you know, everyone got very uneasy or angry? Was there any, what was the sentiment or was everyone just very sad or, you know, what was the atmosphere like? Uh, I think most people just said, just said well, it's just something, something that, that we couldn't do anything about. I see. So just very accepting of the situation. No, it's not a matter of accepting, but just, just saying, well, there's nothing we can do about it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it must have been really frustrating. And did they at least feed you fairly well? Was there things provided for you to do, or, or was it just... Well, they, they, they fed us. Uh, you know, uh, they, they fed us enough. Just plain food. You know. Did you miss your own food from from when you you know are at home with your family? I'm sure it's not really the same food you were getting. <laughs> of course, of course, of course, that's true. And, and of course, the the, uh, the people there, uh, you know, started organizing things, and so. Uh, actually, uh, uh, on one side of the building, that there was a, a, a big uh, open space uh, inside the fence, and so the, the, they were they, they made some some baseball fields and so forth, and so uh, the people inside inside the, there uh, organized some. Uh, baseball leagues and so forth and so uh, there were things like like that 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 went on yeah it seems like you made the best with a difficult situation what were the real like you know obviously you you with your parents and your family what were the reasons they gave you that okay we're taking you all away I mean we know why you know historically what they said but what did they actually tell you to say well is this for your protection or this is for your own good or what what did they say to you to Basically, explain why this was happening, or did they even explain it? Well, uh, I'm not quite sure that I remember exactly what was said. Uh, did your parents explain it to you? Maybe. I guess the nominal ex- explanation is that uh, there, there was n- n- no, no way they could, they could figure out who the uh, Disloyal people would, would were so they, they just figured that uh, they'd take all of us. I see. Yeah. 
And so you spent the summer there, and then where did they move you after that? Then they, they, at the end, end of the summer, they moved us to the uh, permanent camps, uh, and we went to uh, uh, the camp, camp in Idaho called Minidoka. And was that a better living situation, would you say, than the assembly center? No, no, I thought, no, no. Uh, there, there was there was uh, more room and okay. so forth. But, you know, we weren't all confined in, into one one building. Right. Uh, and we were, we were living in uh, barracks type buildings. And so uh, it was like a, a, a small, a small town. And you said that's where you finished your schooling was is in the um, the permanent center in the permanent camp. So what was it like for you on a day to day? Since how how long were you at that um, permanent camp? Oh, well, I was there until uh, near the end of the war. It was, so it was maybe a couple years, or no, it was, it was there almost well, well, two and a half years. Two and a half years, wow! And so that really just became. So 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 in all in all it was it was three years that, that I was in in the in the December Center or the uh, the the camp. I see, and so you really. You really had to adjust. Basically, you spent your latter, you know, high school years in this camp. And, you know, what was it like on a day-to-day basis for you? Did you just kind of get into a routine? Yeah, you yeah. uh, know. You know, uh, hung out with, uh, with uh, friends. Just, and that's, that's, that's what we did all day, is hung out, hung out with friends. Yeah, did you, uh, at any point, you know, um, feel like escaping or that there was any way out or you just kind of like, kind of thought this would end at some time? Did you, did you know it would end or did you just think this might be your, the rest of your life living in this camp? No, I, I figured it would end some sometime. Uh, and of course, uh, there were there were ways to to, to leave the camps, you know. But of course, uh, it's, it's not not possible for for uh, young people to to go out by themselves. You know, they'd have to go out with their family, you know. So, but uh, uh, there were ways to to. Uh, uh, apply for to, to leave and if you found a place that uh, you know outside of the west coast that you could go to uh, and you could sh- show that uh, you, you were a responsible type person uh, then, then uh, you were allowed to, to leave but of course uh, I, I couldn't do that by, my, by myself because I wasn't, wasn't old enough you know Right, and your family wasn't able to to move or or to to go somewhere else. No, no. I see. Um, did you pretty much develop? You know, you said you had a lot of friends there. Were were they the same friends that you had before the camps, or were these friends that you had made from being in the camps? Oh, the, the friends, um, the friends that I made. After I got to the camp, and what was probably would you say is the hardest part about being at the camp? What was the hardest thing you remember um, having to deal with? Not knowing what's what, what's going to happen. Just just day by day by day living. It's just not nothing, nothing really exciting. Uh, not knowing what 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 was going to happen. Yeah. And obviously there was, like you said, a fence and it was guarded. So you couldn't get out unless, you know, you applied and things like that. Um, did you feel like like a sense of oppression or like that was dangerous for you all? I mean, how was the treat? How did they treat you? Well, uh, they, they, actually, I, I didn't I didn't really feel the uh, effects of the uh, administration of the of the camps, 
Because uh, 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 we didn't, didn't really encounter them, you know. Uh, actually, uh, we, uh, we, I did leave the, the camps uh, several times. And where did you go? Well, uh, you know, the, the, there was a great need for uh, people to do farm work, uh, particularly in, in, in that area. Uh, and so uh, each, fall, each fall, they had a program in which you could apply to, to uh, go out and work uh, in the, the farms in the, in the na- neighborhood, uh, to, particularly to harvest sugar beets or potatoes. And so uh, uh, each re- each fall that I was there, uh, I, I did, did I did do that. I, I did uh, go out, you know, for for about a month, uh, and st- stayed on 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 a farm, and worked on uh, on harvesting sugar beets or or harvesting potatoes. Uh, did you prefer being on the farm than in the camp? Well, you know, uh, although uh, it was hard work, but but uh, at the same time, uh, we were free to, to go, go around and do what we wanted to. Uh, and I, I remember the first fall that I went out, that was in the fall of 1942, I was able to go go and uh, to into the little town that that I was based in and go to go to the movies I went to the movies every every single night I mean I, you know after after work after after supper well uh, we walked into town and went in and saw, saw a movie Ah, what was one of the your favorite movies from that time period? Oh, I don't, I don't remember. <laughs> it just, but did it feel nice, like a bit of an escape? Yeah, that must have been kind of a nice welcome escape from reality <laughs> to those couple hours in the theater. Yeah, yeah. And so, um, how about the rest of your family? How did they cope with being in the camp? Well. I, I suppose it was about the same as I, as I did. Uh, my, my older sister, who had just, just graduated from, from high school when the war, when the war started, uh, she, she got a job in, in the uh, camp. Uh, actually, uh, she got a jo- job as a teacher's assistant uh, in in the grade school there, uh, so she was an assistant for for a year, and then the the next year, and the also the following year, uh, she uh, that since there was a shortage of teachers, you know, qualified teachers. Mm-hmm. Uh, she was made into a, the the head teacher. Oh wow! Okay. And what was the school like was, for you? Oh, sorry. She, go ahead. She, uh, you you have to understand that my sis, my my older sister uh, had just just had a, a high school high school diploma. Right, right, and yet she was already the head teacher. She's a, already the head teacher because because she she, she had had this experience of being the teacher's assistant for, for a year or so. Uh, so, so when, when this, they needed another teacher, uh, they, they asked her to be the teacher. I see. And what was it like um, going to school in the camps compared to going to school, you know, before? For me, it was, it was uh, well, uh, well, I mean, I'm put it this way. Uh, the first year after uh, we I came back from that uh, event uh, out in working on the farms uh, they started they started this the schools 
And I only went to, to the school for a couple of weeks. And then I dropped out. And it just, it just never, never uh, went back, went to school for, for the rest of the year. Mm-hmm. Uh, and no one ever, ever uh, uh, said anything to me about it. And I, and I, I just wandered around camp uh, doing <laughs> nothing, I guess. <laughs> Did you get into trouble? <laughs> Uh, and then, then the, the, the second year, I went, I went back, and, and uh, everything seemed seemed normal. So you were able to just pick right back up uh, school with your school studies um, after having such a long break. Yeah, you must be pretty smart. <laughs> Actually, uh, 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 yeah. I, I, I did. I did quite well. Actually, actually, after I came, got back. Yeah, I understand. You're very academically inclined. Actually, the the, uh, the school, uh, even, even though it was done, done under really uh, primitive kind of conditions, mm-hmm. uh, I found to be quite different from this the schools that I went to before the war. Because the schools I went to before the war were, you know, they were um, standard schools that uh, that were uh, based in the, in the country. Mm-hmm. You know, so, so uh, you know, uh, all my classmates were people that, you know, that uh, lived in the country. And... Uh, of course, of course the, uh, the the particular high school I went to before the war, uh, you know, was was uh, it's a typical country country high school in in those days. But uh, and subsequently, uh, after the war, uh, it's it, it's become one of the the really good. T- uh, good schools in in the, in the state of Oregon. Oh, I see. Uh, so actually, it it, it it it's it's it was rated to be uh, one of the, the top schools in the country because it, you know it, 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 of the record that that it, that it uh, produced. Uh, but of course, that that was it was completely different than what what the what the school was like in, in the before the war. Uh, but, uh, but when I got to the, to the camp in the high school there, uh, all the, the, the students there were mostly uh, people that came from the, the cities, uh, you know, Portland. Uh, and, and so... Uh, I, I found the, uh, the the level of sophistication of, of the students much higher in the camps than it was in the uh, in the country school. Oh, interesting. So, did you um, have the same type of uh, class structure? Like, was all the tenth graders together and the eleventh graders together? Or was it a formalized type of uh, yeah, yeah, schooling? Yeah, yeah. yeah. It was, it was based, based like a regular high school. Uh, mm-hmm. And you played sports as well? Uh, only in, in physical education classes. Okay. <laughs> you mentioned that a, a, other people were doing baseball inside the assembly, so... But of course, uh, uh, outside of the, school, the, the schools, the, there were... Uh, also, there's also a league uh, uh, playing softball. Mm-hmm. So, so I, I did get on a, on a on a softball team. Oh, nice! And we, we, we had we had a league inside inside the camp, and uh, uh, so we we played uh, regularly. 
Oh, no. okay. And you said that the level of um, students were fairly sophisticated. What about the teachers? Well, uh, the teachers, uh, there were some, actually, uh, there were some really good, good teachers. And there, there were a few, you know, uh, relatively poor ones. <laughs> and, 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 you know, I was like, like a, a lot of schools, you know, there, there, there's a whole assortment of teachers. Mm -hmm. uh, but but uh, actually, uh, there were a few that were really, uh, really great teachers. Uh, and uh, they, they were teach people who took it upon themselves to uh, actually come to, come to the, the camps in order to be teachers because they, they thought that, that uh, the, the whole internment uh, was not, not a good thing and therefore they wanted to be, be there to uh, help uh, you know, make make, make uh, it, it to be a good experience. Wow, well, that's nice. And these are uh, uh, teachers of all different ethnic ethnicities, not just Japanese Americans, correct? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, the, 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 the great Mokpoku teachers were 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 not 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 Japanese because uh, Japanese uh, uh, there there were there were there weren't that many people who who had gotten. Uh, uh, teaching certificates at that time yet. I see. And what was your favorite subject in school? Oh, well, my favorite subject in school was mathematics. Yeah. Uh, and and uh, uh, in particular, there was a, there was a, 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 a one teacher that I, I really admired. She happened to be a, a missionary who uh, went, went out to, uh, I think, somewhere in South Asia, and uh, uh, she, she was t a teacher in, in uh, either India or, or Bangladesh or some, somewhere in that area. Well, I forget exactly. Mm -hmm. South Asia. It's <laughs> so, so, somewhere in South Asia, and of course, uh, uh, that region was invaded by Japan, and so uh, this teacher had to escape, and so she escaped from from the Japanese invasion, and returned to this country, and of course uh, then. When she was uh, figuring on getting into the job, she she uh, purposely applied to be a teacher at at the internment camps. Oh, so, uh, so she, she of course uh, uh, didn't agree with the uh, the prevailing experience, uh, uh, you know, prevailing thought that the the Japanese Americans were were. Uh, not to be trusted. Uh, she, she, uh, e even though she had been chased out of her, her her missionary work by the Japanese uh, army, she uh, wanted to show support for the Japanese Americans by coming in and being a teacher in the camps. Wow, she and, sounds incredible. Yeah, and and she she was she was a really good teacher. Yeah, and, she. Yeah, you know, actually, I think uh, she was one of the influences in my life that uh, made it so that I I, uh, I uh, went into the you know more mathematical type type of work. Yeah. Yeah, a good teacher can do so much. <laughs> so you actually ended up graduating while you were in the camp. Is that correct? 
What is that like to have a graduation at, inside a camp? You must feel robbed of your graduation ceremony that, you know, a lot of people look forward to. Well, actually, um, I, I, I didn't attend the graduation ceremony. Uh, see, after, after that one year that I skipped, I only get, got, got back to, to the uh, uh, school in the second year, and so I finished uh, my 11th grade in the second year, and then the third year, uh, I went for one semester, and in that one semester, I finished uh, my all, all of the credits I needed to, to graduate, so I graduated in, in January of 1945. Oh, that's incredible. And uh, actually, just after I turned 18. And so I, I knew that I was going to be, be, be uh, drafted. Right, sure. because you're 18. Yeah, because I was 18. So uh, I decided I would go out and see if I could get in at least a semester's worth of, of uh, college work. So I applied to leave and I applied to uh, colleges to en enter. And so you now I, uh, I got permission to leave and I also got accepted by a college. So uh, I left the camp uh, the day after my last class and the day before the graduation ceremony. Oh, so you missed it. Um, so I missed the graduation ceremony. Um, <laughs> oh, but you got to leave. So I guess this was this was the main thing. Yeah. And then I, then I, so then I got, I got to the, uh, the college. And which college? Uh, I went to Miami of Ohio. Miami of Ohio. Yes. Uh, and, uh, of course, uh, very shortly after that, of course, uh, I got draft notice. And so I had to, had to, had to uh, go and get, get my draft physical. Uh, you know, part part way into the into that semester, and uh, in, in the draft physical, they discovered that I had tuberculosis. Oh, that I, I had, you know, uh, gotten while I was in camp. Mm -hmm. Was that common? I don't know. It was common or not? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Uh, so did you did they did they have regular like medical checkups there in the camp and everything too? Where you know was healthcare a, a consideration there, or was it not really looked up after? Uh, in the three years I was in the camp, I never once saw any medical person. Wow! Never once. Not 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 a doctor. Not a nurse. Not. Not any kind of person that had any medical training whatsoever. Not once. And so what happens when people would get sick or break an arm? or? There was a hospital there. Okay. There was a hospital there, and there were a, a, a few doctors. I mean, uh, there were a few doctors who know of Japanese-American descent, uh, uh, but but uh, but you didn't uh, have to see anyone. Well, I, I actually uh, when I when I dropped out of school that first year, my mm -hmm. mother took me to the hospital uh, to see if there was something wrong with me. <laughs> and, because uh, you weren't going to school. Yeah, uh, and I I told my mother I was too tired. 
and so so she wanted to know what, why that why that was in this case, and so she took me to the hospital, and uh, the hospital sent out a young kid who had no medical training whatsoever to interview me, and uh, he asked me some some questions and. Uh, and after a while, uh, that, was, that was it. And so they determined there was nothing wrong with you for not going to school. You just well, they, they didn't make any determination at all. At all because <laughs> there was no 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 medical person that had, had, had talked to me. Right. <laughs> so then, what did your mother do with you? She didn't do. She didn't do anything. She, she just. She, she said, "Well, uh, yeah, there's, there's, I guess there's nothing to do." <laughs> well, all's well as ends well. You did end up graduating from high school anyway, and and I don't think there was anything wrong with you. <laughs> so, what happened after you got drafted? Well, uh, I was able to finish. The, that semester, because mm-hmm. you were ineligible to to serve because of the TB, or yeah, yeah, because yeah, I was ineligible to serve because of TB. Were you relieved? No, I, I, they, 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 let, they let me finish the semester, mm-hmm. and then 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 uh, well, what was I going to do? Uh, the state of Ohio didn't take any responsibility for me because I was not a resident of the state of Ohio. Uh, the state of Oregon couldn't do anything for me because I, I was not allowed to, to go to go back to Portland, to Oregon. The state of Idaho didn't have, uh, could, couldn't do anything uh, with me because uh, I was not a, not a, a resident of the state of Idaho. I went back to the camp, and very shortly after after I went back to camp, the camp authorities said, "You don't belong here. We let we let you go. We release you. So uh, if you want if you want to stay here." You'll have to pay room and board. Wow. And of course, I, I didn't have any money. Right. How, how did you how did you go to college? Does it was a there a scholarship or? Well, it's from the money I earned uh, when I went up went out for the uh, these harvests. Oh, from farming. Yeah. And so they wanted you to pay to to live back on the camp that you were forced to live on before. Yeah. So what did you do? So I left and, and, and I wandered around the country uh, do, doing odd jobs. Because uh, uh, nobody, nobody uh, took responsibility for, for my health. I mean, uh, uh, the U.S. government, uh, you know, washed their hands of me, even though they, they were responsible for for, for the, my my condition. Uh, they, they 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 washed their hands of me, and so uh, I had to look out for myself. So uh, so I was I, in effect I was a homeless person for for the rest the rest of that year. Wow. Of course, uh, at the end of, at the, at the end of the summer of 1945, of course, the war ended, and so uh, my family went, went, came back to Portland, and so I came back came back to Portland with them. I see. And were you still in um, contact with them? You were able to call them and or keep in touch? Oh yeah, yeah. Okay. Actually. Uh, uh, what, 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 one of the things I did was to, was to went out went out and worked on a farm with with my father. Uh, then during that then that summer, yeah. Uh, uh, 
here, here I am, uh, somebody that has been diagnosed with uh, tuberculosis, and the uh, the only uh, cure for tuberculosis in those days was complete bed rest. Mm-hmm. And you were working in the farm. And I'm, I was there. I was out, out working on the farm uh, in a particularly uh, rugged kind of work. Right, and that couldn't have been good for your lungs. No, it couldn't. <laughs> so uh, when we get, we came back to uh, Portland at, at, in the in the fall of 1945. Uh, 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 I ha- happened to meet uh, a, a woman who was uh, interested in, in the, what was going on with the, with the Japanese Americans that were coming back to uh, uh, the West Coast, and she said, she said to me, "Did you know that that uh, Reed College in Portland?" has scholarships for returning Japanese people? And I said, I didn't know that. Well, she said, well, there are, so why don't you go and and, and find out? And so I went to Reed College, and I and, and asked them about that, and they said, yeah, they, they, they have scholarships for returning Japanese uh, Americans, and uh, if you you, you you need to take take uh, an exam to see if you qualify or not. So I took they took an exam and they, and they said okay you 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 you're, you're, you're qualified. And so then they they offered me a scholarship. And so I started uh, college again. Uh, in the fall of 1945, and of course, uh, in those days, uh, every time you entered a, a, a new college, they always gave you a, a, a fiscal exam. And so, uh, I took, I took this physical exam, and, and of course, they, they discovered the uh, tuberculosis all over again. So again, after a couple of weeks of going to Reed College, uh, I, I had to drop out again. Mm. And at that time, be, because they thought you were contagious? Well, uh, I, I, I don't know what they thought. Anyway, uh, they, they, uh, I, got, I got a no- notice from the health department that uh, I, I, I had failed that, that, that physical exam and that uh, I, I had a, had this tuberculosis. And so uh, they said, well, we, you, you need, we need to, to send you to a TV sanitarium. So, so uh, in a whole while, they, they, they did uh, sense. In that case, case finally, since I was now a bona fide resident of Oregon, this, the health department of the state of Oregon sent me to the uh, TB hospital, hospital in here in Portland, and, uh, and I, that, that's that's when my when I when my you know th- therapy for the TB. T- 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 just started started up. Mm-hmm. And then, how long did it take for you to get better? Well, I was uh, I was off and on in in that t- 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 TV sanitarium uh, for uh, several times, uh, and so it was actually about oh uh, four or five years before before it was. Uh, completely. Uh, uh, well, it was before. It, it was well enough to start start uh, the back to go back to Reed College and finish my education. Wow! So you still d- wanted to make sure you'd finish your education. Yeah. 
you know, so the, 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 then, uh, so uh, five years later, I, I, I did, I did start back to uh, back at Reed College, and then, and, and then I was able to finish uh, three years later. And you did mathematics. You studied mathematics. Well, I studied physics. Physics. Oh, <laughs> fancy mathematics. <laughs> Incredible. And what happened to your original home before the war? I mean, technically, wasn't it still your home? Well, uh, we, we, we kept it through, uh, through the war, and, and, and it was, it was uh, I think, rented out to the, one of the neighbors, but uh, when, of course, when we came back in the fall of 1945, of course we couldn't we couldn't get started on on that farm again because you know if you can't start farming in the fall uh, and uh, and there's there no way that uh, you can you can earn any money for another year. So my father decided he would not uh, return to the farm, and he, he started do, do, doing other other kinds of work. And uh, eventually, we we sold the farm. I think you you seem like a pretty easygoing guy, but it feels like every turn of events for you was constant displacement. You know, you were only in high school when you were interred and then you got out of the camp and then you were turned away and you were displaced because of your tuberculosis. And it seemed to take quite a while before you finally got some acceptance in a community in Portland and you're able to finally finish your schooling. I mean, how did you overcome constantly, you know, having to be bounced around and constantly not getting to finish what you started. I mean, you obviously have a really great willpower because you, you're, you, you had a, a, an amazing, you know, career and you've done so much, but it must have been quite a struggle. Well, yeah, but then, you know, I, I grew up uh, during the Great Depression and, and yeah, that, that that that's pretty good training for for <laughs> for uh, working under adverse conditions. <laughs> it's all comparative, I guess. <laughs> You know, I I kind of I, I'm I'm a teacher of uh, martial arts, so I I teach as well because I understood that you you also um, ended up becoming a teacher. Yes, and so I I often kind of look at this generation that's up and coming, and I think, wow, they don't really know what adverse conditions are. And then I look at my life and think, oh, I definitely don't know what adverse conditions are compared to maybe your life or even my father's. And um, I wonder what you think of the generations now. Like, do you feel like it's it's a much simpler time for them, or is it a different set of challenges? I mean, you had such adversity and so much to have to fight for. Uh, do you think these these generations that you see now, do you think they can appreciate that? Well, I don't know if, they, if, they, if the current generation could appreciate my generation, but I, I think uh, the, the current generation has a, a whole, whole lot of troubles that they have to under, overcome. Uh, uh, d- d- difficulties of a much different nature. I mean, uh, think think about the uh, the political situation today, and what uh, what, what what you know the fact that uh, uh, the you know. Th- th- think about the the fact that. The country is run by uh, people like the, the, the current president. I understand. You don't have to be delicate with me, sir. <laughs> We're probably on the very same page. <laughs> uh, you know, 
it, 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 that's that's a difficulty of a different sort than the difficulties that I had to go go through, uh, and probably just just as hard. Uh, but of course, that, 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 that doesn't mean that that the current generation can appreciate what kind of difficulties we went through. Uh, but no. <laughs> I understand. Now, uh, let, let's talk a little bit about what you went through and in and, and a comparative of now, because you we look back in history and you think, how could we ever allow this to happen? You know, how, you know, could these camps even exist? And these were Americans, American citizens that were forced you know, to live in these horrible conditions away from everybody else and pretty much isolated. And then, you know, what happened even with you, you know, nobody took any, any care for you. You got your tuberculosis and you, I mean, you were so displaced and, and we think, you know, this, this could never happen again, but I I don't know, like you said, the, the political climate and, and, the unconventional nature of, of where we're headed um, with government and politics is, do you think something like this could ever happen again in the United States? Do you think that we don't look to history enough and that it can repeat itself? Well, in a, in a way, it's happening. I mean, you, uh, what about the, the, the uh, treatment of Muslims? Absolutely. I mean, and, and the fact that uh, that blacks continue to be uh, you know, killed and oppressed, yes, yeah, and the fact that that you know there can there can be white supremacy rallies in Charlottesville, Virginia, and being. Um, Supported in in a sense by the president of the United States, uh, mm-hmm. you know uh, yeah, that's that's the, the same thing that's happening over again. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I kind of fear is that, you know, people can say something like, well, you know, there's no camps, we haven't made anyone do anything. But I think they're just a little more slick about it, you know, with immigration bans, and with, you know, the way that they're covering things, you know, they're just a little more slick about how they oppress a certain ethnicity. Like you said, today, it's the Muslim Americans or black Americans, and they have their own set of challenges. Uh, of course, different. I mean, you're, unfortunately, for what happened to you was very obvious. And it was obvious to everyone because you were literally put into a camp, right? And just because a lot of these um, other Americans aren't necessarily put into a camp doesn't mean they're not oppressed or discriminated against. You're absolutely right. And it's an absolute outrage that white supremacy feels that they can come out and march on the streets without their hoods because they're proud to be out because they feel they have backing by someone in the White House. I, I'm in 100% agreeance with you, but because you're the one that's been through this already, I mean, what advice do you have? <laughs> I, I mean, where I'm in fear, I, I've, I, I actually started this podcast to try to bring awareness to social issues. And I mean, this was obviously something horrible that happened historically, and we don't want it to happen again. I mean, like you said, you feel it is happening. Is there any way to stop it? I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, all, all I can say is we, you should just have to keep working at it, uh, you know, keep, 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 keeping the pressure on. Uh, but I, I don't know. It, yeah. It, well, I mean, we're not at war yet, right? And um, But, you know, there is a pending war with North Korea. There is a pending war with whoever uh, <laughs> our president decides to get into an argument with. But... There was a really big thing with the Japanese internment camps of looking like the enemy, right? Because not only are you Japanese or Asian, a lot of people can't tell the difference between Asians, right? So, I mean, does that pose to be a threat again? If we did go to war and then they, you know, look to Asian Americans and say, well, you look like the enemy. We can't tell who's who. I mean, it seems very far-fetched, but at this point in time with 
you know, the, the political climate, it, it, it is actually a concern. And it's a concern for, uh, you know, like you said, the Muslim Americans and black Americans as well. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm not sure uh, what's going to happen. I'm not, I'm not sure what's going to happen. Yeah, I could just say everybody needs to make sure they get out and vote and stay informed, you know, and, you know, listen to people's stories so they know that these aren't false things that have happened and are happening. Okay. <laughs> and uh, so tell me, uh, let's, let's wrap up with a little bit about, you know, uh, how you, you did spend the rest of your life after you finally um, were healed from your <laughs> tuberculosis and got the treatment. You graduated, you became a teacher, and uh, I know that you, you have a family. Yeah, well, actually, uh, after I graduated from Reed College, I... Uh, I went and worked in a, at a research lab and uh, I, I enjoyed that uh, a, a great deal. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, uh, on our R&D R &D lab. And, uh, but uh, one thing I noticed was that, uh, you know, I, I was in charge of a, a of a small project, and uh, there were a, a, a bunch of uh, young technicians that that were working on on, on the same project or uh, related projects that uh, were going to night school to get their their. their uh, undergraduate degree uh, but, but since they were going to night school they didn't have uh, access to the to their teachers so the student just went, went to went to class and then uh, as soon as their class was over they, they went home again so uh, and of course you did, they didn't have time to, to be spending a lot of time because they, they were they were working during the day and going to school at night. Mm -hmm. and so Yeah, full schedule. So uh, I found that uh, a lot of these te technicians who were doing that started to come to me, to, 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 coming to me for, to, for help. And so uh, I, I, I really enjoyed that. <laughs> Well, no. Uh, if, if 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 people want want to come, come and ask me uh, for help, maybe I ought to uh, think about uh, doing this full time. Right. So uh, I decided I go I go back go back, go to graduate school and get 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 more degrees and become a teacher. So 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 I quit the that the, that the research research job, which was paying paying a good a good amount of money, and went 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 to graduate school. Oh, and uh, of course, of course, the graduate school uh, turned out to be a uh, a really bad experience. Oh no. Uh, uh, the, the, it was a sp small depart depart department of physics, and somehow, somehow or other, I, I just never, never got along with them. Oh. So, so after I got my master's degree, I decided to leave, and uh, at that point, I thought, thought I'd see if I could get a job at, at some, some college. So I, I, I started to apply for jobs at, at various colleges. Mm -hmm. And it turned out to be that it was the last year in which there were uh, enough jobs open for 
uh, people like me. Uh, so I, I, I did land a job at a small college mm-hmm. in, in Ohio. And uh, that's, uh, so that's, that's what, how I got my start at, at uh, teaching at, at small liberal arts colleges. Uh, and uh, and I, I went from one little obscure uh, liberal arts college to another. And that's, that's why, why I spent most of my time uh, and one of my working years. <laughs> That's lovely. <laughs> Helping others and teaching. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and, uh, and actually, actually I, I preferred the small, uh, obscure liberal arts colleges who were d- doing things a little bit differently from from the ordinary. Uh, and so I, actually, I, I, re- I really enjoyed it. Even, the, even though uh, these these colleges were were, were obscure and therefore struggling, and so, several of them, uh, you know, uh, actually got went bankrupt and and had to close and so things like that. So uh, you know, it was not not an not an easy uh, career, but it was still very rewarding. Yeah. Well, it doesn't seem like you really got the easy way out on many things. So the colleges is just the final thing. Why Why would that be easy for you? It's been so hard as it is. <laughs> You're constantly faced with challenges and constantly overcoming them. It's, it's amazing. And um, I did have two more questions. One, I, I always ask at the end of every podcast, and I'll ask you in a minute. But the, fir- the first question is, It's amazing to me that you don't have or didn't develop some sort of resentment for the U.S. and wanting to just like move and live somewhere else after you were so ill-treated. Why did you decide to stay and then have your family here? Well, of course, I I, I, I really really felt more and more that this internment was, was not a good thing. Uh, but I, I never re- really uh, felt uh, a, a, st- a strong resentment about it. I mean, what 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 good would that do? <laughs> That's very zen and uh, <laughs> very very uh, forgiving of you. <laughs> I'm sure there's a lot of other people that were quite bitter. <laughs> yeah. Well. Uh, uh, it, it, it's one of the things that made, made me turn into a, 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 a real political radical. Uh, and, I, and I consider myself to be a, a really far left uh, radical politically. And uh, this, this internment uh, helped me Become become that way, uh, and so uh, you know, uh, I, I I really can't say that that uh, I'm I'm bitter about about uh, the internment. I I, did, I just feel so very strongly that it, that it's, it was a really wrong thing for the for the government to do. But I, but I can't feel bitter about it. Yeah, well, you are a much more forgiving person than maybe I would be. I don't know. <laughs> I, I respect you so much, so, so very much. And I think I'm very glad that you decided to stay and be one of those very far left political <laughs> radicals that can come and, and help be a part of this country and help continue to shape what I hope you know, it will become and, and what we hope it will not become, right? <laughs> we need more. We need more of you on our side. So, and uh, my final question is, what comes to mind when you hear the word tradition? Well, uh, I guess I'm in two minds about it. Uh, tradition uh, is, is, is uh, 
uh, something that, that will help us uh, as we look uh, to what's, what's going to happen next. Uh, but, uh, tradition also is, is, is something that will uh, keep, uh, keep certain kind of restrictions on us. Uh, so, uh, you know, uh, I'm in two minds about it. Mm-hmm. Very good, very good. I very much enjoyed our conversation today. Thank you so much for joining me. Okay, thank you. That's all for today's episode. Thanks for listening to the Sifu Mimi Chan Show. Please subscribe and rate my podcast on your platform of choice and leave a review. You can become a patron of the show at patreon.com slash Sifu Mimi Chan to help keep this podcast going. Follow me and interact on social media at Sifu Mimi Chan on Instagram, Twitter, or Facebook.